Yeah. Yeah. Most of it's already a complete page, and the March sheet for license to cut will be probably made available on your group chat in the next few minutes as well. Um, so, in terms of the talk today, um, my name's Hill, for those of you who haven't met me. Um, I was president of the Dental Student Council last year, um, and then I created and set up the uh, PAL program as well. Um, yeah, I'm Nisha, I'm currently the vice chair of Dental Council. Um, yeah, pretty much that's it. Haven't done anything that interesting. And she's in BDS3. Yeah. But quite well. Um, so, in terms of the talk today, um, the talk today we're going to be focusing on the clinical exams that have got coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Um, we're going to have a quick talk about the bar at the end for a couple of minutes. There's going to be a separate talk later on in the year um, for you about that as well. It's just to make you aware of it at this stage. So, the clinical exams that are coming up in the next time. Um, basically, it's a two parter, so it takes place on your clinical skills day. So, um, for those of you who have clinical skills here on Monday, so the group that I was with today, um, you'll have your perio exam in the morning and then you have your comms exam in the afternoon. Um, the aim of these exams basically is to assess whether you are safe to undertake treatment on patients under close supervision. So, basically, they're not expecting you to be a ready to go qualified dentist. They're basically expecting you to follow step-by-step -step procedures that you've learned throughout the clinical skills course so far um, and follow the instructions of your tutor. If you can do that and do what they say and be safe, that's the major thing. Can you be safe for patients? Then they will pass you in terms of these exams. These exams are very different to how you have done the exams in terms of A-levels in school and stuff. You're not aiming to achieve 100%, okay? It's not like that. It's are you safe to practice? and are you competent to carry out the procedures that you're talking about, okay? So they're very, very different. So your mindset also has to be slightly different. It's feel relaxed about them. Clinical exams you'll actually come to enjoy. I know it sounds amazing, but actually um, clinical exams actually become a group. So actually the more you do them, the easier they become. Um, so let's start off with perio exam. So it's basically 10 minutes long, and it's basically a one-on-one -on -one chat with a clinical tutor where they can ask you anything um, on clinical perio. Okay, let's put the prize in there. It's not reciting all your perio tutorials throughout the year. It's all about the clinical aspects of perio. So actually, in terms of what probes you can use to carry out a BPE, um, what instruments can you use to bribe the tooth super gingerly, okay? You won't have to be asked about subgingival bribing, so like RSB and all that sort of stuff. That stuff you get taught in uh, GS, so don't stress about that at all. This is all about or, sorry, yes, it's all about super development and diagnosis, okay? Most of the chat will be on uh, talking about things like um, oral hygiene instructions. So they might ask you, they have all of basically your hygiene kit there, and they'll pick one of these out of random and ask you to demonstrate how you would um, give these instructions to a patient. So, for example, in my year, I'd give an electric toothbrush and I had to explain to uh, Dr. Zara, how I would um, teach a patient how to brush their teeth properly with an electric toothbrush. Okay? One thing you will need to know is you'll need to know all the different TP sizes. So you need to know the colours and the sizes. Big thing to flag up for the sizes the size is of the wire, it's not of the bristles on either side of the wire. So when you get asked about sizes and that sort of stuff, the actual value in terms of millimetres corresponds to the size of the wire. Okay? Keep it simple because they want you to show how you read the patient, okay? So when given all hygiene instructions and that sort of stuff, keep it simple, none of the jargon, okay? Nice and simple. It makes it easier for you to revise and it makes it easier for you to actually deliver it on the day, okay? Be familiar with all of these things, so manual toothbrush, electric toothbrush, floss, some of the different floss variants, so like your um, flossettes, yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Intermental sticks, super floss as well. Super floss is a more rare one. You won't really use that until it gets to bridges and stuff. Benches, um, but know the major ones as you're going forward. Okay, most of the perio quick, you'll have a perio kit out here on the bracket table next to you. Okay, so don't be scared of it. However, the majority of this you won't need to know. The truth of it is, and at the moment, you the one you need to be able to identify is can you identify what your civil scaler is? Okay, to carry out the RSB because they're like, sorry, not the RSB, the super gingival primer. Okay, you might be asked, how do you identify that from, say, the scan there? Okay, so you need to know your cross sections. Okay, so your single scaler is your triangular cross section, your universal correct, your single scaler is more like a semicircle. Okay, and the difference between the universal correct and the bracy correct is the angulation on them. Okay, you need 
and that sort of stuff. Okay, so basically when you pick it up, don't worry that they're not covered. Okay, a, a lot, there's been no such case around every year that they cover up the handles and stuff like that. That's not true. They just have a normal kit out there. Um, they can't be asked, quite frankly, to cover them up. So be, just pick up the one and double check that it says scale on it. Okay, you can't really go wrong. Okay, make sure you've got the big things they're going to be looking out for. Okay, they won't ask you to put PPE on to do the perio side of things, so you don't need to worry about that. But one of the big things that they do flag people up every single year is the, the light. You need to make sure you turn the light on, angulate the head for the position that you need to angulate the head for, and then make sure you adjust the light appropriately how you're with the patient. Okay? One of the big red flags that uh, Miss Ledette in particular likes to fail people on is for not using the light appropriately. Okay? Make sure you've got a finger rest, um, and then make sure you can also use um, the mirror for soft tissue traction and also reflecting the light as well. Okay? Um, you'll be asked to super gingerly bribe one tooth, okay? So make sure when you get pole to scale the upper left claw, you actually scale the upper left claw. We've had other failures in previous years where people have got mixed up and scaled by, by mistake, okay? So it's not just, don't, I know it sounds like a stupidly easy mistake to make, okay? But just double check everything that you go through. If you need to double check and you need to double check the upper left claw, would you say yes, okay? But make sure you get the right tooth, okay? That's one of the other big red flags, okay? Make sure the terminal shines parallel with one axis of the tooth. All the simple stuff that they teach you in terms of all this stuff, okay? Make sure it hooks around the tooth, okay? Nice, small control strokes, okay? Um, but most of the, from what I remember as well, when my year did it, we didn't have all of the gum and stuff on, on the teeth. It was basically just the normal models, okay? So they're not looking for you to actually remove all of the material on the teeth. It's all about positioning and technique is what they're assessing more than anything else, okay? Um, so as long as you've got the right technique, you can show you can scale all surfaces of the tooth. That's the major thing that they're looking for. Um, some of the perio resources that you can get. Um, this used to be a really, this was a really, really good one we've had for years called the Good Practitioner's Guide from the BSP. Just be aware if you do use that, um, but it's available as a PDF online. Just be aware if you do use that, that's got all the old classification, the old perio classification, so you have to pinch of salt. However, all the actual technique stuff and stuff that they go over is really, really useful. Okay? On keys, what I'm going to show you is quickly on the council's keys page, um, when you go down to BDS2, um, but here I've got some stuff that I created last year in terms of oral hygiene instructions. So for the oral hygiene instructions, it's a list. And it basically goes through each or hygiene aim and tells you, talks you through generally how I would word it if I was instructing it to a patient. And then I've put some links into some useful YouTube videos and stuff for you to watch at home as well. So make sure you give those a read. Has anyone got any questions on the period side of things before we move on to the common stuff? Okay. A little bit of a red flag. Perio, more people failed perio last year than they did comp. Okay, we're not talking masses, we're talking out of the whole year maybe five or six. Okay, it's not it's not huge from the technology most people pass. Okay, um, but it's simple stuff that most people get better on that they do get better. Any questions? Yes. Do we need to know the classification for um, periodontitis and um, gingivitis? No, don't worry. The classification and the stuff that you don't need to know at this stage. It's more just a case of, if I'm going to carry out a BPE, uh, what does the BPE code 3, what will I see in terms of black band partially visible, that sort of stuff, what's the measurements in terms of correlating between that and the black bands, that sort of stuff. The practical side of things, not so much the diagnostics. Yeah? At the moment, more people get posterior teeth than anterior teeth. Yeah. However, it's a bit of pop up. Okay. Usually, they just look together. Molars, 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 and anterior, like incisors. I think we got three molars and molars last year. Okay. I got them before. Yeah, yeah. I think they just didn't move the posterior. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because at the end of the day, what they want to assess is things like the finger rest. So it's easy to get an anterior finger rest, whereas most, mostly, if you go in posterior, it's going to be better to assess it. Uh, yeah, Kevin. Uh, what's the non more reason why people should have Finger rest is a big one if you don't have your finger rest. The light, as Phil said, if you don't position yourself correctly, so you, you know how, like, the vet will have, like, all this, you position the patient, then turn your head, go through that checklist, position the patient first, 
then you position yourself, you position the light, you pick up your mirror, you think about what you're doing with your mirror. So if you're retracting, make sure you've got finger rest with that. So you need a finger rest for both hands, but if you're only using it for indirect vision, uh, for light, then you don't need a finger rest. So make sure you're checking your mirror hand and then you finally pick up your instrument and put it in and make sure you've got your finger rest with that. So it's just kind of going through that checklist that they've kind of drilled into you. And it's, whenever you just tip out one of those steps, that will be a reason that you failed. So it's the tiniest things, to be honest. Um, if you start scaling the wrong tooth, that's a massive one. But if you stop and you're like, I started doing the wrong tooth, they'll be like, okay, can you do the correct tooth? Um, and I think you need to like realize they'll be sitting there all scary and stuff, especially Dr. Zara. But yeah, um, I had her. And I'm like, I was literally shaking and my hand was falling off the tooth. But if you just take a moment to compose yourself and you know you're doing something wrong, you stop, you put your instruments down, take a breath, say you'd like to start again, and they will let you. She asked me, why am I starting again? So you're identifying your mistake and then you correct that mistake. And that will mean you're still passing because as Phil said, it's not about doing it 100% correct. It's about recognizing what you are doing right and what you're doing wrong and how to change that, if that makes sense. Um, last thing, just to add in, when you're doing your old hygiene, um, this, apparently this is a thing, so when you're holding the model, hold it so that you're coming in at the back, so you can't hold the teeth and then come up behind the teeth, if that makes sense. So either have the patient hold them, or you choose to hold your model for you, and make sure you're going into the mouth in the way that you go into a real mouth, because that's to make sure that you're showing the patient the correct way to do things, because you can't like rush from this angle. To make sure you're going into the model like this as well. Yep. With regards to the oral hygiene, um, like, do we have to, like, when, if we say, for example, to the tutor to hold the model and then show it to them, do we have to say, okay, now would you like to have a go? Um, uh, you, you can say, I would, uh, you can just say something as simple as, I would then get the patient to demonstrate to me that they, they can uh, carry it out correctly. Okay. But you don't need to actually get them to do it. <laughs> Well, unless you want to really waste time. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, any other questions on carryover? Everyone happy? Sorry, or as happy as you can be? more than about 10 minutes. Yeah, so usually it's about five or six minutes of questions, maybe about seven, and then a couple of minutes worth of scale position. They might ask you to stop because they've seen either you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, for example, with me, she asked me to do, I was doing the buckle, and because, yeah, you don't need to get rid of the gum. I was not, I didn't know that, so I was trying to get rid of the black calculus. And then she's like, can you just go on to the labial side? So don't worry about getting rid of that. They're just checking your positioning and your angula angulation. And if they ask you to move on, don't panic. It just means that they've seen enough. So. Yep, any other questions on Perio? No, fantastic. Um, the last thing in terms of resources to flag up, um, this is something that I came across probably about a year ago or so, um, called Dental Juice. It's basically like an online, what we call like CPD website. Um, but as like a student, it's like 20 quid a year. Um, and it, it's useful, not just for Perry, but actually for all the clinical specialties. It has really useful videos on there, um, torture through subjects and stuff. And for those of you who've done endo, and um, endo produces the hell out of you, this website actually will help explain it. Um, but, so yeah, just to flag that up, um, it's useful for Perry and Cons, the whole, the whole shebang. Okay, so uh, the infamous one, the, license, the formerly named license to cut. Um, basically, this is your comms clinical exam. Um, I'm presuming everyone here has got an approved exam to. Anyone here not got an approved exam to? Everyone happy? Okay. Um, they obviously need to be set in your jaws by next week. Um, one of the things I would say bringing you into the exam, okay, I usually advise taking a photograph of the tooth that you're working on before you get started, printing that out along with a radiograph, print out the radiograph. Okay, technology fails us all at some point. Um, so it's useful to have a printout of both a photograph of the tooth to start off with and also the radiograph, just so your tutor can compare what you finished with to what you started off with as well. Okay. So what I want to go through here is the mark sheet. The one that I've got here is the old mark sheet, but Dr. Foxman has happily today given me the new mark sheet. Okay, so um, I'm just going to send this to the group chat now, hopefully how the WhatsApp will help us, okay? So, um, hopefully this should be very familiar to you. For those of you who've done your mock, um, it's very, very similar, okay? Um, the 
top bit, basically, this has been rejigged to make it more like what you have um, on clinics uh, in terms of clinical assessments, which is a almost like a cheese mark assessment, what we call TMAs. Okay. Now, basically, there's been a lot of nerves in the middle of your year about people. If people get asked for more help, are they more likely to fail? That's not correct. Okay. The the truth is, it's based on the complexity of the tooth itself. Okay, so basically, before, whether you have a really, really complex tooth to do, like a really, really huge penalty, or you have a really, really small hole in a premolar, they would judge the same. What this allows for now, this new mark scheme, is that you're, if you uh, have a more complex case, they understand it might not be as perfect in terms of the outcome that you have. Okay, so it's trying to be fairer to everybody. Okay. So, in terms of the mark P, because I know it's quite difficult to actually work out, okay, basically, you're judged, there is no self-assessment, um, they, they just removed that today, but basically, you're judged on these eight areas, okay? So, presentation, rub it down, caries and tooth management, health management discussion, matrix application, restoration, professionalism, and management of the procedure in terms of time, infection control, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to do is try and help you out with it, because I know pretty much everyone's done a mock now, yeah, everyone, so everyone's kind of familiar about the, the bit as a whole. What I want to go through is sort of start to finish what they're looking for, and try and help you out in terms of get the best mark that you can, okay? So, in terms of presentation, who's actually confident in terms of presenting their case when they get, if the tutor comes to you in the exam and goes, okay, what team are you doing, and what are we doing today? Who here, put your hands up, would feel confident in actually being able to explain it right now? No? Alright, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go on to Okay, so on the sheet for your Sorry. Right, so on the sheet for your you can get on heat, okay we've got some an overview of each sort of stage, okay? One of the things that you need to do is work out how to present your case, okay? So, if we're doing a lower six, okay? One of the most common things that you guys do is lower six is down here for the exam, okay? If I have a tutor that comes to me and goes, what are we doing today? I'll go, okay, so we're doing a DO restoration in the lower right six. That, in a snapshot, tells them we're doing the lower right six, it's an interproximal cavity and it's a DO, okay? Then what we need to actually give them after the information in terms of the services that you're doing is what can we see clinically, okay? Is it grossly cavitated? Is it a small restoration? Can we see any overhanging or spotting out and that sort of stuff? So if it's a huge hole on the back of the tooth, all you need to say is it clinically it's grossly cavitated and can we see a focal exposure at the moment? That gives them in five, six words exactly what you need to know, okay? Then we move on to the radiograph. So the radiograph that you have the printer out next to you, you go, okay, radiographically, we can see a large radial lucency that extends to inner third of dentine or, or wherever, wherever floats your boat, whatever it is, okay? Don't talk about when you refer to the x-rays, don't refer to caries, don't refer to this sort of stuff, just refer to radial lucency or radio opacity, okay? If it's, if it's a restoration, it'll be radio opaque most of the time. If it's caries, it'll be radial lucency. Okay? And what you're trying to assess with the radiograph is basically the proximity to the pulp, which is basically telling you if it's got daylight and loads of room between it and the pulp, if you clear away a little bit of caries off the pulp floor, it's probably a low risk of pulp exposure. If it's either into the pulp or it's right above the pulp, are you going to shy away from removing any soft caries off the blood cavity? Probably because you want to avoid pulp exposure. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so review. Okay, so we're doing. So, hello, doctor, whatever. Today I'm doing a DO restoration on the lower right six. Clinically, it appears grossly cavitated. You can see the, uh, we can see it's got a focal exposure. Radiographically, we've got a large radio lucency distally, and that seems to extend to the inner third of NT, for example. Yeah, so nice short sentences. Tells them exactly what they need to know, and then basically what they'll do from there is they'll then tell you, okay, so what are you going to do next? So you go, okay, so I'm going to get some isolation, so I'm going to apply a rubber dam. So, you come in, get set up, 
do your presentation, okay? Isolate the rubber down. I've seen a few cases now um, of where people like to do single teeth isolation for some reason, or they'll isolate only a couple of teeth with the rubber down, okay? With any contour, if you want a, a really big tip, okay? The more teeth you isolate, ideally a whole quadrant, the easier it's going to be in terms of restoring the work, okay? That's for a few reasons, okay? If you isolate the entire quadrant, I can see the occlusal plane of those teeth, okay? That helps for a number of reasons. All of the cusps will tend to line up in that quadrant, all of the fissures will tend to line up in that quadrant. So it tells you how high you need to build the tooth when you're restoring it, what morphology like is the tooth around it, and it also helps you build up because you've got more space to hold the rubber down out of the way. Okay? The less room you have the rubber down, the more it wants to pull out and in the way. So actually you, you keep it out of the way. When you're doing your whole bunch of your rubber down, some big things to flag up. The guide that you stamp on front of it is only the telling you where to place your first hole. Okay? That's telling you which tooth am I clamping. Okay? Always clamp at least the tooth behind the one you're working on, if you can, provided it's not seven, okay? If you're working on the six, clamp the seven, okay? That gets it out of the way. That first hole punch is telling you um, where to punch your first hole for the clamp tooth. Do the biggest hole you can for that, just so it doesn't tear, okay? And then every hole that you place in front of that one should be one to two millimeters in front of that. You're not using each stamp um, marker, okay? That's because if you, when you stretch the rubber down out, there's going to be too much material to wedge in between your teeth. Okay, so make it easier for yourself. Also, big tip, stick a widget in the most anterior point of your dam. Again, that's to stop it right up at the top. Okay? I've seen loads of different people do rubber down in weird or multiple ways. Let's stick, stick to the simple stuff. Okay, so I don't want to see any frameworks going down the mouth. I don't want to see any weird inverted framework up over the nose type of thing. Remember, it's assessing you as if you are a patient, okay? So the rubber down needs to be clear of the nose. It needs to form a good seal all the way around. When you set up your rubber down, an easy way to test whether it's actually worked or not, stick a little bit of water from your three and one. If it cools there and stays where it is, then the rubber down is set up correctly. If it starts to drain on the back, you know there's a gap in there or there's a tear in there somewhere you need to address that before you get going, okay? All of these things, the examiners will be assessing, okay? The other thing is, have you flossed the clamp that you're working on? Have you selected the appropriate clamp, okay? Whether you have a winged clamp or a wingless clamp, truthfully, doesn't really matter. The wingless clamp, uh, sorry, the winged clamp, you can use exactly like the wingless. So whatever clamp I generally have on any of my patients, I stick the clamp on the tooth first, and then stick the rubber over it, isolate the quadrant with the rubber, then put the framework on again, okay? Each person differently, okay? When you're flossing in between the contacts, when you put the rubber down the mouth, floss down the tooth, and then when you pop through the contact point, pull it out upwardly. Do not pull it the floss up again because you'll pull the rubber down up out, uh, back out with it. Everyone clear on rubber down? Cool. All right, carriage removal, okay? So one of the big things that everyone goes to is, oh, okay, so is it's, I get access, I clear the periphery of the J, I do this, I do that, okay? What does that actually mean logistically, okay? For those of you who don't know, the EDJ is where the enamel meets the dentine, okay? If I get to a stage around here where there's no enamel there, that's no longer the EDJ, okay? That is the periphery. The periphery just means the outer rim of the cavity, okay? The e a lot of people go over here and go, oh, they're referring to the EDJ, but there's no enamel. Okay? All of these are things that your examiners will pick up on when you're speaking to them, so make sure you always use the right and correct terminology. Okay? When you're clearing away, okay, think about it when you say access. If I've got a large cavity like that, do I actually need to access? Or have I got enough room to put my Cyrus head or my um, carrier's excavation tools in there? Okay? What we would use a fast, um, a fast bird for, so either like a 3 3 or 5 4 one or something like that, is to remove any overhanging and unsupported enamel. Okay? That's the big thing that you want to do with these cases is that if I'm clearing the soft carry away from the EDJ around here and that carry is undercut and I'm left with overhanging enamel, then I would use my fast burr to remove that enamel away from there. Okay? A lot of people, or people that have Dr. Foxman, I've heard a few times today, oh, I've been told I'm not allowed to use the slow rose head for carry's excavation around the periphery of the EDJ. Okay? 
each Tuesday you'll get will be very different. Okay, not all of you have got the toxin. Um, you have to tailor your care and removal approach appropriately for the tutor. Okay, that's difficult when you've never met half the tutors before. Okay, we still have it in place now. We'll get a random tutor in the day and have to tailor it to them. However, the important thing is to have the discussion with them before you go ahead and do it. Okay? If you have got the box on that day, if you say, okay, I'm going to clear the soft carriers and the periphery of the EDJ, okay, um, I will then say to Dr. Boston, um, okay, is there a particular instrument you would like me to use? I know I can use a large rose head bird, or I can use a spoon excavator. Tell them that you know what the options are. It's like a driving test. I'm looking in the mirrors, back and forth, back and forth. But I have to make it really bloody obvious that I'm looking in the mirrors, back and forth, back and forth, okay? The ones that fail this exam, the ones that plow ahead, don't ask any questions, do something wrong, and then they get flagged up as a result, okay? It's all about explaining to them, okay, I know I can do A, B, and C. These are the reasons that I would do A, B, and C. What, which of these would you like me to do? They tell you what to do, and then you follow that, and then they check in with you at the next stage, okay? So I personally always use the slow rose head, but you might get a Dr. Foxing or someone that asks you to use a spoon excavator. Again, I've seen a few people today. When we use a um, slow rose head, okay, the slow rose head will not get rid of sound denting. Okay, so if you're going around with a slow rose head around the periphery of the EDJ, if tooth tissue is coming away as a result, that is soft carries. Okay, so don't be afraid to number one press too hard, and number two, don't be afraid to actually apply a little bit of pressure and move around it. Okay, the thing that they want to see at the end of your periphery of the EDJ carries removal is that you've got a nice target spot in the middle of soft carries that you haven't pushed, okay? If we're seeing cases where there's a big chunk taken out the middle of it, that's going to be an instant red flag, okay? Unless you've got cases where you start off with a huge portal exposure to begin with, okay? But again, that's why you have the photographic evidence to back you up, okay? It's, all, it's also there for your safety as well, okay? What we want to see basically is a nice clean periphery of the The way to check that clinically is to use your straight probe, yes, straight probe, not carrier probe, straight probe around these edges, okay, and they should feel hard and scratchy. If you're not confident with tactile feedback of your instruments, you need to actually practice a lot next week, okay? It needs to be hard and scratchy around here, okay? Yes, you get cold, don't use the uh, straight probe around the floor of the cavity, but you're not going near the floor of the cavity, we're avoiding going near it, okay? It's absolutely fine to use it around the periphery of the EDJ. Okay? And it should be hard and scratchy. If it feels soft and flaky, if it feels sticky, then more stuff needs to come away from it. Okay? Okay, on the matrix. Okay? Um, on the matrix is there only to allow you to build up a compact point. Okay? It does, if you're missing the distal wall and you're missing also the buccal wall or the lingual wall, okay? you only need the on the matrix there to build up the proximal wall. Okay? You can then take it off and freehand everything else. Okay? A trick in patients that people often use is basically to wedge, put the wedge in beforehand, leave it a couple of minutes, take it out, put the other matrix in, basically to make a little bit more room. Okay? In your teeth, in your jaws, the truth is it's not going to make a difference because it's in stone, so it's not going to move. Okay? So you can just stick the other matrix around, okay? make sure you put a wooden wedge in. One of the big red flags, again, to point out with these wedges, if we see any wedges sticking into the ginger beef like this and not nice and all the way through, that again is a big red flag because it's also going to cause damage to the patient. Okay? So make sure it's parallel to the floor, okay? And make sure it goes all the way through. We don't want to see any wedges sticking in and out. Okay? Again, all these sorts of stuff, avoid trying to make holes in the rubber dam because again it makes for piss poor moisture control, okay? And you want to actually protect it. Okay? When you put your arm matrix around and it's nice and tight, you've got a wedge in there, what you should be able to see is a nice seal around here. Okay? If you see any gaps or anything like that, you know either the wedge isn't tight enough or the arm matrix isn't tight enough. Okay? Sometimes we do get cases like this one where you've got to build up a really, really tall wall to get a contact point. Okay? There's no problem with building up the bottom half of the wall, loosening up the matrix a little bit in order to burnish it further across to get that contact point. The problems come a lot of times with these matrix where you tighten them as tight as you can, you build it up all the way, you take it off, and there's a huge open contact between the two. Okay? That usually happens because you haven't loosened it and burnished it to the two steps up. Okay? 
everyone happy with matrix, all that sort of stuff, okay? You can, you do have the option with matrix systems to use the sectional matrix, okay? A lot of you won't have really used the sectional matrix too much. Go for the base, stick with the basics for this sort of exam. If you feel confident with the older matrix, stick with the older matrix, okay? Just know when to use a sectional matrix. So the tutor might be like, if you're planning the same two, then you can say, um, ID, like, as in just so that you, it's a good show that you have the knowledge, being like, you can either use an omni matrix that would have this benefit and this drawback, or a sectional matrix with this benefit and this drawback. So you, you, whenever you feel like there's something else you should be doing, but you're not going to do it because you don't have the experience, say you know it in theory, but then obviously stick with what you've done with clinical skills, because that's all they expect you to be able to do. Um, another script that I've been telling a lot of people is really to give to your patient. Uh, and to really, really deep cavity like this, okay, we would stick gingival traction cords around to move the gingiva out of the way. You can't do that with your demo models with the jaws, okay? So one of the things I recommend that people do is before the lighting foot exam, okay, if you've got a deep cavity like this, reduce the gypsum height around this tooth by a couple of millimeters. You can either use a clasper, you can use a sickle scale or whatever you want. If you lower the height of the gypsum around the tooth to cut it away, that means that when you stick your omni matrix, because you've got to factor in this, uh, when the carriage removal takes place, you're going to lower the height of that area. So you've got to give yourself some extra room for the omni matrix to fit around. The last thing that you want in the exam is the carriage jumps up gingival and you've got to then start packing away at the omni matrix, uh, sorry, at the gypsum in the exam, because that doesn't look very good because you're damaging the patient. Yeah. What's, what's gypsum? Gypsum is the stone that you set the teeth in. Okay. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Okay. So, everyone's happy with acid etching, scotch bond, then you incrementally apply your resin composite, okay? When we add acid etch, we always selectively acid etch the enamel, okay? Don't go throwing your acid etch around the dentine because the acid etch will collapse the collagen matrix and you won't get a good bond, okay? If you choose to ask, why, what are we using? Why are we using it? Okay, be, be, be always on the ball because you might have to justify it for what you're doing. Okay, so we're selectively acid etching the enamel. That removes the smear layer. That opens up the prostheses and makes it a rougher surface and easier to bond with. Okay, the Scotch bond universal. Yes, I know. I'm about to say the infamous words. Picard is wrong. <laughs> okay, Picard is wrong. Okay, um, so Scotch Bond Universal is actually a type 4 dentine bonding agent. Okay, it has the ability to strongly, um, it has to etch the um, enamel and the dentine. Okay, however, we use it as a type 2. Okay, so we use a separate acid etch to what we do um, the dentine bonding agent. Okay, so if you get a really shit day out of practice and haven't got any acid etch, you can use DBA on its own, but here we give it some extra special. Um, stuff and we also acid etch as well. Okay. Um, make sure you always, before you build up with your composites, furnish to the tooth next door to get your contact point. Okay. One of the big things that we see, as I said before, is these open contacts. Okay. And as we said before, if we, um, you might need to stage your build up as well. Okay. Another little trick that sometimes people do. Okay. Sometimes we stick a little bit of flow of the composite on the bottom just before we actually build up with the normal resin composite and that's just to seal off any micro pores in the bottom as well. Yep. Uh, what's it mean to burnish? So burnish is basically where you push it. So basically you know like the pear burnisher or ball burnisher, basically like a long pear shaped tool. And you basically push the matrix here, push it out this way to build up that contact point. So this matrix, so the matrix is now touching the tooth next door. In a patient, it's going to be slightly easier because when you remove that wedge, those teeth are going to come actually close together. So actually, open contacts are less likely in a patient because when the wedge goes, the teeth come close together. In the stone, you've got it slightly more difficult because they don't move at all. Okay? Any other questions on this? No? Fantastic. All right. Building up, up once you've got your proximal wall built up, okay, I always recommend people build up one cusp at a time. The problem is, if you go pack and pop it in the occlusal surface and build it all up at once, when you build and build and build, it ends up being really, really super flat. Okay? One of the big things that we look for is actually is the morphology correct? They're not looking by any means for the most ideal composite you've ever seen in your life, not like all the Instagram ones that you see. Okay? But they're looking for it to at least be functional. Okay? So, what they're looking for is you build up one cusp at a time, if they all roll into each other, 
then you get the fish pattern actually built in the middle. Okay, they're not looking for big huge mountains. Okay, and one of the other things with the peas are a lot of tubers, okay, is cusps that have the edges like this. So it's more like a big oval like that, okay? Well you actually your cusps are supposed to go down like this with two two planes for each cusp, okay? So this has a so this cusp has one angle going down this way and one angle going down this way. Okay? So make sure it's like triangles that go down like this. Okay, we're not looking for overall like this. Okay. And then what we said before, remember about the inclusal plane, so look down the inclusal plane, use the teeth behind and in front for reference in terms of height, width, etc., and where the location of the fishes are, because they will guide you in terms of when you're doing your composite build up. Okay? It's always easier if you can pretty much finish your composite just doing the build up, not having to polish it on top. Okay? Final checks, okay? So if you're happy, okay, what you need to do then is once you take your matrix off, everything's happy, you need to check the contact point. The big one's gonna be your contact point, okay? Everyone happy knows how to check the contact point? Yep. So when you stick your floss through, so another thing, I've seen a lot of people use the floss that's attached to the clamp. Don't do that, because <laughs> it pulls the clamp off a lot. Get a different bit of floss, okay? Push it through the contact point, okay? Um, it should feel a little bit of pain as it goes through, okay? If it's too tight, it won't go through at all, or it'll shred, shred the floss as it goes through, okay? If it's an open contact, it's just gonna fall straight through and it's not gonna have any resistance at all, okay? Again, they're not looking for the most ideal thing, but it's important for you to identify what's wrong and say how you would address it in the future, yeah? You know how you said if open contact add more? Yes. What do you mean? So you can add more composite. But like, by putting the matrix back, back on, then you can just add more. Yeah. Because Dr. Roy told me that if it was open, I have to cut a box then as well. So this is the difference. If you go ahead and polish it all up, yeah. and it's all on down, then you're going to have to add cut a box into okay. it. If it's not had anything added to it, and it's not had moisture exposed to it, then it's going to be fine to bond more to. Okay. So the big thing is whether it sticks, okay? So if you take it all to, don't take the make, sorry, don't take the rubber down immediately off and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Assess all this stuff before you take that off. Because then you can just add more composite to it. So put the matrix back on and just push more against it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because okay. yeah. it's composite, so you can add more composite to composite like normal. The difficulty comes when people start to assess the contact point after they've taken the rubber down off. You've got moisture control that's really, really bad, and then the composite won't stick. Okay. okay. Those are the points you have to cut more in. Okay. But if we checked it before, like if everything's nice and dry still, you can still bond more composite to it. If you, need. if you add more composite, then won't it, won't it end up like a bit longer? Do you know what I mean? No, so the old one and then like the new one. No, no, no. So actually, it's all about the polish. How if you smooth them off, actually, it, then it'll be okay. It's usually okay. 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 Um, I feel like it might just sometimes it might just be it depends on the amount of space that you have because sometimes it might just be easy to give yourself a bit more space by yeah. moving away a bit and then just putting it back in. So it depends on what each is doing, I'd say. The difficulty comes if you start to cut the new proximal box in, <laughs> then you have to you 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 ruining the chance of building up anywhere else. And also, then you have to re-edge, re-dry, re do the whole thing again. Okay. Yeah. If you can add more on, no, that's the most that. ideal and conservative way of doing it. And also, what kind of size box are you looking at to cut if you do have to do one? Like, how deep would you have to go? So it's not that deep. It basically, you just you basically take it to just below where the contact point level would be, okay. so that you can just fit so some in there. It's basically giving it a composite. Obviously, is micro mechanically retained. Yeah. Can be micro mechanically retained. So it doesn't need lots. Okay. It's not like an album where you have to cut a huge chunk out. It just needs enough that actually, if you swap it in, it's got a little bit more pull. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay. If it's too tight, one trick that I always tell people is if you double over your floss or a couple of times over your fingers, okay, so it's slightly stronger, try and pull that through because sometimes it's just a little bit of fed teeth obligation or stuff gets stuck between the teeth. Sometimes that doesn't the trick. Okay. If it's too tight to even do that, it shreds all that. Okay, it's really a case of cutting the new proximal box in there and starting again. Okay, but if it's got to like two hours and fifteen minutes away through the uh, uh, two and a half hour exam, okay, and you haven't got the time to do it, you can still pass easily as long as you say I've identified the compact deficient for these reasons. Okay, this is how I would address it with the patient. So if it's an open contact and I can't address the open contact today, what I have to tell the patient, I have to make the patient aware that it's um, in open contact, and I have to tell them I will bring them back at a future appointment to close the contact. However, they need to be aware 
in terms of there's going to be food trapping and food packing in that area. They need to be, be religious in terms of their TP brushes and stuff to try and keep that clean. Okay, all of these things are telling the examiner that you know it's not ideal, but you're, you've got an action plan in place to address it going forward. Okay. Same with um, if you've got uh, a contact point that's too tight, you don't have time to do that. You just say, I could use, ask them to put some sort of super floss underneath the contact point to keep that nice and clean. Okay, it's just about having a plan of action to address it in the future. Okay. Again, morphology was not actually that bothered about morphology, provided it's functional and it's not hugely built. Okay, the big red flags um, are.